Um, but please do submit your evaluation forms if uh, that's that's the last day. Um, okay, so today we're gonna um, we have we have lots of things to review. I'm just gonna go fast on the um, some of the theoretical part because we, we need to uh, focus on two major questions, which are pipelining and caches. Um, so basic, what is it? Is it final comprehensive? Uh, it's comprehensive, but uh, you're not going to get asked to write um, assembly code for RISC 5 You've already done that in your pre-labs. You're not going to get asked to write, I don't know, 20 lines of Verilog. That was the purpose of your labs, right? Exams are just for you to understand the theoretical part, how you can solve a, solve a problem, right? Um, that being said, you need to know Verilog and is five, right? Um, did you write the exam for our section, or is it every section writes the same exam? As far as I've known so far, it's separate. Would you like that to all be unified? No. One, two, no. No. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> no, that that's not what I said. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Is it going to be like pretty much only about like chapter four and five? The the majority of the questions are coming from chapter four and five, but in order to understand like pipelining performance evaluation, you might need some knowledge from chapter one, right? In order to understand what what's reach five. Uh, in essence, you need to know chapter 2 in general, but I'm not going to ask you just to uh, multiply two floating points, right? You've already done that in your midterm. Other questions? So, stuff that's not really related to chapter 4 and 5 or not be covered? No, uh, so might not cover directly, but indirectly you need to know, right? So don't come back to me and say, oh, that wasn't in chapter 4 or 5. You need to know some of the stuff that are chapter 5 and 4 because they are related to the first three chapters, right? I'm trying to put the majority of the weight towards chapter 4 and 5 because 90% of you have already done the first three chapters. Um, okay, chapter 4, we were talking about data path, right? So data path, we gradually built this. You've already coded the majority of that. Uh, so, what you're gonna, you might get asked is, first of all, I've seen so many questions about how we're gonna decode um, some of those hex operations. I mean, that could be one of your easiest questions because you just need to uh, have a have a green card handy and see and convert this uh, convert the hex to binary and see what are the points are representing, uh, what are each binary are representing for each type of you know operation you might have R type I type S type and each of those and all of them are written in your green card right you just have to pull up your green card and see what are uh, the specific you know uh, segments of that specific uh, operation right right they're representing to and also you have your control you can bring it in your exam I'll, I'll put an announcement again um, you, you are allowed to have one H sheet so that should be pretty easy for you to decode. Um, yep. It's like, okay, it was about the, the thing that's not given. Can we write that? The tables? Yeah, you don't need to memorize this. Yeah. I mean, Obviously. yeah. You need to know how to use this. Okay? okay? Uh, yeah. But can you know how to use it? Will it be provided on the exam? You can make it for your own. Uh, green sheet will be provided. Is that oh. on the green sheet? Uh, not all of it, so let me see. So, you're going to see all the instructions. All of the instructions are in green sheet. You're going to find their opcode, their func, tree, and then you're going to have this here that separate each of those, right, with the type. You're going to have the name of the registers. You're going to have, yeah. I'm not sure what that is. This is the size, yeah. Okay? So that should be pretty easy. Yep. Can we have it in a bigger format? Because it's really hard to do. It was big? 
I guess it was big. So, do you mean the green shade? Yes. I guess it was uh, clear, wasn't it? Because if you zoom, it's clear. No, I mean, not to this exam. point, but... No, no, the exam was really hard to read. Really? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll make sure to have a look at the printed version, okay? Yeah. It might be the, the cause that the printer has, didn't have a good resolution, perhaps. Um, okay. I'll have that in mind. All right. So, basically, you need to know for each of those um, type of instructions, what sort of data path is getting activated using what control uh, operations, right? So you have R type, you have load branch, and up to the pipeline, it should be pretty just schematic. You just have to know what the process is, how the flow works, right? And do please read the text of the book. Uh, your reference book is very comprehensive. Whatever you're gonna get asked is already there. Spend a few days, two days max. Um, read chapter four. You can just read it twice, right? Um, are we like these diagrams? Are we gonna uh, have it given like in the questions? Or? One question could be: I can give you, uh, depending on the instruction, I can ask you to complete one uh, flow given an incomplete flow. That would be one. Uh, but again, I'm not. I don't want you to memorize things. I don't want to understand why we have a control here. Why we have that four over there. Why we have a. Why we need an adder right after PC. You need to understand those. Just read through the slides and the reference book. They they are pretty easy. Okay. That leads us to pipelining. So for pipelining, you might get asked about. For instance, a question that we're going to give you an assembly code already of, of a high-level language, and we're going to ask you just to find the number of stalls, and then by the number of stalls, you can find the uh, no, number of instruction counts, and then using the number of stalls, you're going to find the um, some performance evaluation metrics, right? Um, that we're going to see an example today, right? So for pipelining, you remember we had in RISC five five stages. Instruction fetch, which instructions are fetched from memory. ID, we're going to decode the instructions and then it has the register read on it. We have X, execution, right? Mem, which is the memory operand, and then you're going to write back. So we talked about three different hazards. A structural hazards, which that in which we needed a, a, a required resource and it wasn't available, right? It was either busy for other operations, or it wasn't available at that time. Data hazard. I talked about it um, in a high level. So the majority of the things that we are taking uh, care of is read after write. Read after write. So you read a value, x1, you read this, say it was 20. So you read this at 20. You should have read it, and, and, and then this x1 shouldn't have been changed, right? But then, before you read 20, some, someone else write it, 25, okay? Now it's 1, it's 25, and you read 20. So that's a read after write hazard. The, we have other type of hazard like write after write or write after read, but the majority of the focus in this course will be those problems with data hazards, right? You have a value that you wanted to read, but it's been written before you need to read it. Um, also, for the branches, we're going to have control hazard. So these are the three different things that we need to take care of. In general, in a five-stage pipeline, when you are starting from um, instruction fetch, ID, X, mem, and write back, right? In the majority of the cases, you, are, you can get away with instruction fetch unless it's a branch. So if you are writing back some value and the next iteration, so that's this iteration, the next iteration, you're going to get away with that instruction fetch. If you don't have any optimizations, no forwarding, no branch prediction, no nothing, so you're going to have to wait three stalls, right? Because after one, your ID would be here, after two would be here, and after three you can pass 
the right back. So by three stalls, you're going to be able to use the value of the right back of the previous instruction. So that's for the vanilla, let's say, vanilla case of pipelining. No, no optimizations. On a five-stage pipeline, except the control hazards, which we have in branches, without any branch prediction, you can get away with instruction fetch, but the rest, you have to put three stalls. However, when we add forwarding, depending on the instruction, we can forward, we can add another hardware to forward the intermediate results from execution for all of them, or from mem for load only, to the next cycle. So with that, we're going to reduce our three stalls to one. And for the case of um, for the case of uh, load, you're going to have one, right? For the case of non-loading instructions, for instance, an add and then a sub, we might be able to get away with that. But again, there are instances that we can't. I'll, I'll, we're going to see some examples on this. So in general, because um, for load, the results will be available after mem, right? Even with forwarding, passing to ID wouldn't be possible without having one stall or one bubble. Does that make sense? Okay, and then another optimization could be on top of this about branch prediction. Instead of uh, waiting for instruction fetch, right, we can anticipate that in ID stage. So we're going to save one stall on that. Or, as we talked about it before, code scheduling, right? We were, without anything, we were loading twice, right? This value to x1 this address to x2, and then we were adding this. So right away, we were accessing the value of this uh, in the next instruction, which was add, right? But we thought after rescheduling, why not we load the third one after this? So we have the highest, the furthest, right? We make x2 the f as further as, fast as possible. So we get away with having a stall here. Also, the same happens for x4, because we wanted to use x4 right after that. So in this case, we could, uh, you know, uh, decrease a, a couple of stalls, uh, a couple of, you know, so that's why we have two less cycles, two fewer cycles here. All right, so these are the type of optimizations we can start with pipelining. So one question would be to start uh, giving you some assembly code and then ask you to find the number of stalls without anything. And then the next part would be, let's have forwarding on that what's going to be the no new number of stalls? Let's add branch prediction, the third part. What's going to be the new number of stalls? Can you reschedule the code to, to have a uh, fewer number of stalls? So the one question you might be able to see is this type of question, which is pretty easy, right? Let's have an example. Any questions before I start that? Um, for each different stage, for each different stage, uh, we assume that in this course, yeah, might be, yeah, in risk five, yeah. So I think for add, so this is five stages, we need five cycles to complete the instruction. Yes, yes, yeah. There are more sophisticated systems that they, they, they have multiple cycles per instructions or the other way around, yeah. Okay. yeah. But we assume it this way for simplicity. Okay, so this is a translation of this high level language, right? And this is what you might be given in an exam. So I'm going to give you this and some sample table, right? It might be more. And you are required to identify the stalls. First of all, identify the data hazards. So those read after writes or control hazards with different colors, perhaps. So in the next slide, we're going to zoom into this. So we have, we have, um, we wanted to, uh, add this base A of I to on each iteration while I uh, is not equal to N, right? And then increment it with two constant, I++, plus plus, and then we do come back to this while loop, right? So that was the uh, assembly code for this small segment of uh, C-like language, right? And let's focus on this now. So that's that's the magnified version. By the way, I've already uploaded this on, on Moodle. You can have a look at this slide. All right, so let's start right away 
So now the question text says, uh, we have five stage pipeline without any optimization. So everything is, uh, should be taken care of, okay? So the first problem is, now we are <coughs> loading this address to this dollar two, okay? And then right away we're gonna add add i to that, okay? So the issue is now we don't know what the value of this after uh, before write back our next iteration in the pipeline, right? After instruction fetch, we don't know what to decode, okay? So there is a read after write for this value for this variable, right? Dollar two. Does that make sense so far? So we needed to access this. But our pipeline, our pipeline is here. We haven't arrived to this point, right? We have to find a way to shift this ID after right, right back. So it should be here. Three more installs. Okay. So from here, it should have been here, perhaps. So that's the first type of hazard. Uh, you can just write read after write, or you can just write data hazard for that specific variable. Okay. So we parse down. Line three is loading the uh, this uh, this address of dollar four to dollar three, so everything is fine for that, except the fact that at line four, just like line two, we are adding i, and increment, a constant to that. Okay, the same thing happens for that. So now we're gonna have another read after write for this. Okay, so these are because of these two. So this is so far dollar two and dollar three. Okay. Here we go back down, then we are adding the results of dollar two and dollar three to dollar five. Okay. What happens here? The instruction fetch after we fetch the instruction and we go to ID, the same cycle. Because we don't have any optimizations, we have to read and write at the same cycle, which is not possible. So there is another um, data hazard for both of them, actually. Right? So that's for this. So now we're here. Again, for storing that, do we have any issues? So now we're here. Align the store. Why do we have a problem over there? Can anyone explain? Because we just uh, had to write back in the previous line. So there's a read after write either because of that. Yeah. For dollar five. Mm -hmm. And then Okay. Right. So we go back down. In the add i dollar two, you just have to parse where dollar two was last used. Uh, I can see it actually. Oh yeah, here. So since this is far away, right? We've already passed the write back. So at line four, we don't have an issue for dollar four because we've already passed the write back. Okay. But after add i for branch not equal, we need to compare these two value, right? To go to L one. However, the result of this add i is not ready yet. We're going to have a read after write for dollar two right here. So that's the first issue, which is a data hazard. That's why it's, it's uh, shown in red. After that, <coughs> there is no optimization in branch. There are no branch prediction. So right away, when we want to fetch the instruction, we don't know where to go. Either we have to come back to L1 or we just have to leave the loop and then do the rest of the operation, right? So right after um, instruction fetch, we're gonna have a control hazard, okay? Does that make sense? <coughs> so control hazard was the type of hazard that normally in branches, we, uh, we do see them, right? So if you don't have any branch prediction, that means that you don't know what's the output of these branches. This could be any other branches. So you don't know if you're coming back to L1 or you're going out of the loop or exiting the loop, right? So right after 
this, you want an instruction, you, know, you want to fetch the instruction, you don't know what instruction to fetch. But there's an instruction after that. Yeah, just think about that there are some other, other programs, right? So you don't know where to go because there's a branch and then you have to wait for the right type of that to get the results. At least, or, or the mem for so the. Would you just stall all five? Would you just stall five after to the control hazard? Uh, why five? Just to let it all process through. So, um, for that, for branches, if you recall, uh, you would have at earliest, right? Because you needed at instruction fetch, uh, three would be enough again without any optimization. We have other parts that we add some optimizations that your branch predictor anticipate the branch at ID. So you get away with one of those. And then you might add other things that can reduce the instruction. Okay? So for now, you identified all those hazards. Now there is another point that you need to put the stalls, right, or nopes. You might also be given such table with more numbers, right? These are the cycles. Cycle 1 up to, uh, I don't know, 30, 40. And these are your assembly code again. These three, can anyone mention what, why we have all these three right at the beginning? Because there's a branch. Yes. So assume that you're coming from this, going back up. Since you don't know, uh, uh, you're going to go to L1 or you're going to leave and then do the rest of the code, right away you have to put three branches. Before instruction phase, right? Before IF. And then for the rest of the cases that you had data hazard, right? For this, for this, 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 all of them, you had to wait from the right back to, to uh, use it at the IDE stage. So. That's why after if you need to put three stalls because one stall, so just think about it here. So one stall will put ID there, the other one would put it here, the third one will put it after the right back, right? So at this point you can use it. That's why three stalls needed. So going back here on a second line, putting three stalls will make this right back to make, make it available for the ID. Does that make sense? Yep. Can you explain why it would use three space? So for branch, do you wait for mem to get the information? Yeah. And then that's why we use three space, because we want to make sure we get the mem. So yeah. And since the branch doesn't have any optimizations, you need to issue it before IF. If we had branch prediction, we might be able to get away to ID. OK? But now this is just no optimization case. All right, for the, for the other cases that you identified uh, in the previous slide, you're going to add this, right? Three stalls. And then what you need to report is the number of stalls. So three stalls for the branch in blue, and, the, and those three for the add i, and then the rest, OK? So these are the number of stalls in a five stage pipeline that you needed to identify and add. So by adding these stalls, you just have to sum them up. Okay? How many stalls did you add? It? Six? A six of three, right? Right? Yes, yeah, six times three. So you have 18. Okay? How many instructions we have? Let me know the instruction count. Why? Why eight? No, you were right. Why? Why eight? <laughs> Why eight? Because we have eight instructions. You can count the lines. Yeah. It's one, two, three, up to eight. Yeah, it's eight instructions. Right? Yeah. So going back to perf to performance evaluation, you had eight instructions. You had eighteen stalls per instruction. So the CPI per iteration is going to be the number of clock cycles divided by IC, right? So your IC instead of eight 
was 8 plus number of stalls and there is this 4 that I'm going to explain right now. So you add them up, it's going to be 3.75. Can anyone explain in a high level what does that number tell us? The average cycles needed to, to process a construction? Yeah. So instead of 5, we managed to make it to 3.75. So can anyone explain what, what does 4 mean over there? You know that, no. You already know that. <laughs> so think about this. Look back here. Can you come up with that four? So we had eight instructions, 18 stalls. How did we come up with that four? Um, initial four. Um, no. <coughs> we have five stage pipeline. Okay. <coughs> yeah. Before I die, we have five stage pipeline. Okay. In a perfect case. Okay, you have now what? One instruction, two instruction, three, four, and five. Okay, let me know. I have five stage pipeline. I have five instructions. What's going to be the number of overall cycles that it takes to complete this pipeline? How do I count it now? Nope. Why 10? Cycles is the number of cycles. So total number of cycles are what? Number of columns, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Why nine? You have five stage pipeline, but no matter what, you had to wait for one to finish at least, right? So you are, so whatever you have, whatever number of instructions you have. You just have to add the number of all of the instructions, including the stalls, right? And plus that to four, because that four is the closing the windows for the pipeline. This four. Right? So this case, I don't have any stalls. So my overall number of instructions would be uh, one, two, three, four, five. Plus four, nine. If I had three stalls here, I would have to add it, that three plus the rest of the instructions plus the four because I have a five stage pipeline. Okay? So coming back here, when you count here, we had eight instruction counts, we had 18 stalls or nops right and we had four so add them together it's going to be that 30 okay as long as your pipelining stages are fixed yeah yeah as long as you have five stage pipeline so if you want to make that generalize yeah you need to add this stage of the pipeline i i, I re believe one of the sample questions had that question in the course okay so everyone got the idea why we have four here so <clears throat> the total number of clock cycles are, are going to be your number of instructions number of installs plus four divided by number of instructions so for instructions that don't actually have five stages such as code and square do we just assume that it takes five stages your pipeline nevertheless has a is a five stage pipeline yeah yeah unless you change the architecture right you, have, you might have a 14 stage pipeline. Okay, and your throughput, you are given, you are given the, the clock cycle of the CPU somewhere in the question. Uh, yeah. 
two nanosecond, right? So by that, you're, you should be able to compute the throughput, which is the clock cycle divided by your CPI. And since you've been asked to write it in MIPS, it's, it's um, 10 to the raise of 6, right? So it's going to be 133, OK? All right, so that was the, the part without any optimization. So you might be asked to, uh, you know, <coughs> consider a pipeline that has other optimizations. You just have to read the text of the question. So on the case, any concerns? Yeah. All right, so let's have a look at part B. So in part B, we have the following optimizations. <laughs> We can read and write at the same cycle in register file, right? Read at half the, the first half of the cycle and then write on the second half. Um, we have forwarding path, so we can, depending on the type of instruction, we can forward either from X or from MEM. And then program counter calculation for branches. So our branches are more sophisticated now. Instead of IF, we can forward the results and anticipate them as ID, okay? So, now having that in mind, let's, let's come up with the new type of hazards, okay? So, the first one, can anyone describe what that is? Um, we don't have to solve. At this point, we are just, uh, well, actually, you know what? Let me just uh, let me just bring you here. Might be easier. Okay. So let's just start from this. Why we have one stall before a start? If we didn't have any optimization, right? Now we have forwarding and we have branch. Anticipation at ID, okay? So I can use a forwarding path of X to ID, right? And then by using just one stall, I'm going to be able to get away instead of three stalls. Does that make sense? No. I mean... Yeah, because it's a loop. You can you can have the stall either here or here, because you might come back here or just you leave. Okay, or two ways. Okay. So forwarding, we are adding more hardware in order to forward the intermediate results. You recall in in your um, in chapter four, if you take a look at the the text. So we had some reg forwarding registers in between each of those stages, right? So this can hold the intermediate results. So you can just use the forwarding path, right? To just bring, I mean, this is one pipeline. So the, so when, when your ins it, uh, instruction number one is at this stage, instruction number two is at this stage, right? So you can have the results available for it for this guy. Right in in one dimension, it's gonna come back to itself. But when you when you just unroll it this way, it's as if we are for what we are passing it to the next iteration. Does that make sense? For each question, we have we have a different kind of forwarding. For each, by there can there can be different forwarding methods. Yes, forwarding for load instructions are different than stores, for instance, and for branches, they're different. So in this stage, it's saying that we can move from the ID stage to the MEM stage directly. This is the third from MEM, MEM, MEM to ID. Oh, MEM to ID. So for, for branches, for branches. Only for branches? Yeah. Okay, program, okay, yeah. Right? Yeah. Without forwarding, without, so without forwarding, um, <coughs> 
uh, for which instruction at i yeah you need three stalls here you see you need three stalls yeah got it yes guys please read the text of the question everything is if 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 there are no optimizations uh, you just have to just go with the default version you cannot issue instructions after instruction fetch for branches before IF. Is this version risk-5? No, so depending on the realization of that instruction set architecture, that pipeline might support this type of optimizations. Some companies just start a default, by, but, but it doesn't make sense because it's going to take a long time to complete the pipeline, right? They, they might want to uh, optimize it to the max. Yeah. Okay. So, with these optimizations, now we can anticipate at, at ID for the branches. We have forwarding path. So, for the forwarding, let's come back here. By adding only one stall, because this was a load instruction, right? This was a load instruction. At alias, we can have the results forwarded from mem to the next s. So instead of three stalls, I need only one stall now. Okay? You use a forwarding path. You still need one stall with that. Okay? Um, for the next one, again, for the, for for this load, that's the same. Mem to x, right? You just have to mention what forwarding path you use. It's a mem to x forwarding. Okay? For the rest of the instructions that are not at load, right, for like add and store, you are able to forward from x. That's why in this case, for x to x, right, you just forward it without any installs. Okay? Here. Um, and for the branch, the last one, you can forward it from X to ID now. That's the new branch, the optimized branch that was mentioned in, in the question. Everyone got the idea why you, you could reduce these trees to ones? Could you do store break and what's the, what's the hazard at, uh, at I, at the second instruction? This not, one? Yeah. It's a, it's a data hazard. Yeah, because from mem, we are going to X at earliest. So in order to make that happen, you need to push x one on the right, so one knob in the middle. That's why this should be this, right? One because, stall. Because it's a load instruction, so the values yeah, since the it was load, yeah. The register will be changed. What is it? So be, is it because it's a load instruction? Yeah. So for load at early, so the load forwarding path goes from mem, right? So at which stage of the load instruction does the value inside a dollar sign two actually change? Right, at, right, at mem again. Right, mem? yeah, oh. yeah. I mean, from mem onward. Yeah. Yeah. So at LDS we can consider that mem. Huh. So, but with the add i, the change happens at wb. No. no. At x. At x. Yeah. Okay. Because it's so, so you need to just. Uh, Think about the um, the nature of the instruction, right? So when you come back and, and think about an add i, what you're doing actually, you're adding i adding a constant to that, right? So after the x, you have the results, right? But you're not writing it back yet. Yeah, that's why we are forwarding because so it's it's like you are producing something before going to the to the uh, I don't know uh, checkpoint. You just some, someone else has another branch. To just output it that way as well, as uh, it's, it's going this way, as as well as the other way, right? You're forwarding the intermediate results right away, okay? So what because that's going to be the same result you're writing back. So you're not going to change that. that. Sorry. So what happens at the write back stage at the LW? So depending on the instruction, you write it back either to memory or to a register, or depending on on, on, on the situation, yeah, right? That's good. Wait, it will happen, but the results that are getting written back is going to be the same results you've produced after X. 
that was the same results, right? It's like you have a you have a flow of products. But it was here, endpoint was here, right? You change something up to this point. Now this is fixed. It's x. So the same x goes here, and then the same x goes here. But if you have it right here, why wait this? Just forward it somewhere else. It's going to be still x, right? Because the change from here. Okay. So, so that's that's the nature of forwarding. Uh, I I I strongly suggest that you guys have a look at the uh, the beginning of chapter four. In in the forwarding, we have the pipelining for each of those instructions. You understand each of those instructions load or store or branches how the, uh, the pipelining works out, okay? Have a look at those. But in order to solve this, you need to know that you have to distinguish between load and non-load instructions and also branches, okay? So, by having these optimizations, we are able to forward from mem to x uh, and we reduce the three stalls to one. So, the number of stalls needed have decreased quite a lot actually. So one is stalled for the branch, which is shown in blue, and three more for those that we could not get away with forwarding. We needed at least one stall. Okay. So now our instruction count is still eight. Didn't change. Our number of stalls change from 18 now to four only. So that's why. So it used to be 18. Now instead of uh, Where is it? So instead of three point something, now we are able to make the CPI up to two, which is pretty close to one, which is the maximum uh, cycle per instructions, right? How did we get 500 for clock again? Uh, it was in the text of the question. So the processor clock is two nanoseconds. How do you get the. It's an inverse of that. One over the S oh. Yeah. Right? How do we know where to forward it to? What? Say that again? Is there some hints where how you forward it? For what, this part? For the previous one. Here? Yeah. Which one? So, any of the, how, why do you just forward them to execute? Why not forward them? Well, for example, the last one, why do you, why do you go to execution for ID instead? So, this, because this is a branch instruction, right? For, so be, for branch instructions, you need to, so previously it was at instruction fetch, but our branch predictor is, so let's say, more sophisticated. So the text says, program counter calculation for branches has been anticipated in ID stage. So we can get away with that after instruction fetch, right? So we save one install there, and we save one with the forwarding, because we forwarded the result, we don't have to wait up to mem. That decreases the three to one, yeah? Ask questions if you didn't understand, guys. Right. Can you explain why there's only one stall again compared to the three stalls in the previous one, in the beginning of the, the first So th time. think about this as one instruction after this, right? So you're going to have this one, right? So if you put one stall right here, your ID could pass the instruction back to where you want it. Okay, to the input? Yeah. Okay, okay. Because yeah, you got to know, now. yeah, where to go now, right? Uh, okay. So that's not going to be put at the end of the Yes, I yeah. could, could have put it here or put it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So now let's add another optimization on that. Part three, beside the previous optimization, we is assume to in introduce a static branch prediction, right? So there is a branch prediction that always do the, uh, does the following. Backward branches always taken, right? 
So we always know that we're going to go backward. So that's why this output is already predetermined. We already know that we're going to go back to L1. Okay? Backward always taken. Either, so this, is, this has been implemented in the system, um, and it's a static branch prediction. So no matter where we arrive, so this is like meaningless um, to compute. We already know that right away, we're going to go back to L1. Okay? So, still I have those other hazards, which is not shown clearly here. So this is like this, this and this, right? And this. Still, still I'm going to have issue here because I don't have the results available, right, from the dollar four. So, even with that, I could reduce only the first stall that was telling me whether or not I'm going to come uh, go back to L1, right? So I, I save this. There's no need to that stall anymore. So that branch prediction solved this. But the rest are, are already there because they are the, the forwarding hazard for the data hazards, okay? Does that make sense why we have... Now we, we have only reduced this to, to zero, so the rest of the three are still there. So it's three. Again, eight instruction counts, three stalls. So we are even coming back from 5 to 1.875, which is pretty close to 1, which is a perfect pipeline. All right, so now you see that by <coughs> increasing that, our throughput has been increased, right? Okay. So then let's say we have to go to a branch after that. And then and the branch, the branch prediction takes place. It always assumes you have to go back. Yes. You have to wait one stall. Or one stall or no, one? you don't have to wait anymore then. Because as, as soon as you, you instruction fetch this, it you assume that, yeah, because it, it's a static branch prediction. Static branch prediction for backward branches, so, so branch always taken. If you had to go like, down, you don't, if you do not have to go up. Okay, so like branch not taken? Yeah, so there will be a star. Yes. Yes, but this branch prediction, which all yeah, that's right. In that case, we were on. Uh, we, one stall or like. Uh, depending on the case, we, uh, the question statement didn't tell us anything. Yeah. But in general, we had to halt the pipeline and then add the stalls to just revert back and then continue the rest. That was that was a miss. Yeah. Okay, so the last part is asking you to reschedule the code. Okay. This LW is actually, I, I have to rename them all to LD so you don't get confused. So these are LD. Yeah. So you can easily say that because these two were independent from these two, right? Why not add the first two load together and then first add two eyes together? There is also a branch delay slot that uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's going to help you to de delay the branch. In a perfect case scenario, you would have able to just get away with all of those if you were able to um, reschedule these two. The text of the question will tell you whether or not we have a branch delay slot or not. Okay, So we can delay the branch. In that case, we are able to resolve all of them. Yeah. So we are using the forwarding path. Since we have rescheduled the code, this is also fine. We know we're going to come back there. So there is no issue on the branch as well. So there are no installs. Five, eight instructions, no installs. So you're going to have an ideal CPI of one. Yeah. And out of your 500 clock cycle, you have used all of those. That's why you have 100% utilization of your throughput. It's 500 again. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. And won't that change the CDI? No. Just we can more than that. Let me see. Oh, I see. So, yeah, um, this is the asymptotic one. So it doesn't, it, it's, it's for n cycles. So, yeah, 
This is another, so you're not going to get asked for asymptotic uh, CPI. You're going to get asked for CPI, which is not going to be ideal. Yeah, right. I'll, I'll, I'll update this because there's two schools of thought to compute CPI. One is asymptotic, which you don't care about four numbers because you're taking it into account in cycles. It's sort of a limit. You, you A limit function when you don't, don't compute the constant. Yeah, for the real CPI, you, it's not, it's not going to be ideal. But for asymptotic, yeah. I'll update the, the text, yeah. Okay, any other questions? Uh, for dynamic, you can, uh, you can think about it that perhaps like if you say 80% of the time branch was taken and then in that case I, I need to give you guys the number of n for the loops so like you can compute it for that um, but definitely it, the text of the question will be clear so you, you don't get confused yeah any other questions about pipelining so make sure you check the slides again tonight I'll upload this and you know change the asymptotic to the to the real CPI um, okay so chapter five we mostly talked about memory hierarchy and we mentioned that the higher in the hierarchy we are the closer we are in, in, in CPU to the processor the size is normally smaller so we can fetch, fetch things faster and <clears throat> the speed is going to be faster the size would be smaller and the further away we go from the processor the size would be bigger we go towards memory and then the disk and on the other side we pay the price that the the, the, uh, the speed is slower right and we, we mentioned that we're going to ca compute heat ratio which is the number of heats per axis so whatever we wanted to access we could find it either here which was a heat if we didn't find it, we go one level lower, either from L1 to L2 or from L1 to memory, depending on the uh, type of the cache. And then there was a hiss. Uh, uh, there's going to be a miss, right? So misses. And we're going to have a miss ratio, which is the number of misses per axis. OK? So in this chapter, we talked about three different uh, architecture of caches, direct map, and, and uh, <coughs> Let me just give you here. I'll go back to this. Direct map, set associative, and fully associative, which is a full set associative. So these two are um, on both extreme side of the uh, architecture of the caches. For direct map, for each of those tag blocks, you have only one place to look for or map for. That's why it's a direct map. Okay. On the other side, for a fully associative, you have all of the available blocks to play around and put randomly. So normally, this decreases the cache uh, miss rate. At the same time, it's going to increase the hardware needed to process that. Because for each of those, you need to have comparators at all of those blocks. Okay. While for the direct map, you need only one comparator because you know where, where to look for. It's either there or not. That's why the, the miss rate is going to be higher because you have fewer amount of spot to place your data, right, based on their tag. But the, the hardware would be easier to uh, you know, realize. On the other side, normally the miss rate is going to be lower, but the hardware would be more sophisticated. Somewhere in the middle of this trade-off, you're going to have set associative. Depending on the number of sets, you have different type of comparators. So we're going to have a discussion about this today. So first of all, for direct map. As I mentioned, we map <coughs> only one choice. In order to find the, the place to map, so we just have to have a mod of block address mod number of blocks. Okay? A number of blocks is a power of two. So that's why here we have eight blocks. So every eight, we're going to come back and map them on top of each other. So that's why in this case, given the eight and this amount of memory addresses, which is five, 
we're gonna check for either the less significant bits and the number of this significant bits uh, is, is gonna determine what block am I referring to okay so always we're gonna have um, for instance this one which is 0, 0, 0, 001 it's gonna be mapped to block 1 also 8 1 after is gonna map to this one again another 8 is gonna map to this right all of them are gonna map to this gray block how are we gonna distinguish these these four using their tags in this case the first two were the tag number so we were talking about this as an example so by the number of um, tag we can understand which of those uh, blocks we can go for and number of blocks is a power of two of the size of the assigned bit so for direct map we have only tag and data okay and these are the indexes we have so say on a one word block in initialized state all of those valid bits are none when there is something there we're gonna put it to set it to yes or plus one or the other class okay so this is the address assume it's a five uh, five bit address so the first tree refers to the index on the least significant bits and then the most significant bits one zero refers to what yeah so previously it was nothing here right it was none so we wanted to access <coughs> this address so nothing was there that's why it was a miss so actually it was a miss so now I have to come back down to one level lower assume I had L1 cache only and one level lower was memory that's why I have to fetch the results of mem of this address that I was looking for and bring it back up, okay? That's why it's a miss. The cache block was this, okay? And then I set this from n to y. Question? I was just gonna ask what b was. It, it, it's, it's the validity bit. It's a valid bit. You either have a valid bit or not, right? By default, when you initialize, it's gonna be all non-valid. So because the, the memory wasn't found in cache, it sets the valid, puts it in cache to be reused again. Yeah, and that's why it's a miss because we were hoping to find it in the cache, but we missed it. You have to go back down from memory, fetch it back, it, bring it up, and put it in the cache. Okay, you have to pay the price for that, and that's that's the miss penalty that we're going to talk about later. So yeah. does that mean there's a hold until, it, or does it just go directly from memory and then back in the cache? Uh, it's sort of a hold. We are we are increasing the latency, so we are. We are, have to, we are paying a penalty, actually. So it's a time. The time will increase. The number of cycles we have to miss, yeah, it's going to increase. Rick, I'm saying, what's the, what's the pipeline look like for this? Does it, does it fetch from memory to cache and then from cache up, or does it just fetch directly from memory? No, no, it's, it's, it's always through the hierarchy up. Okay. Yeah. So assume that memory could be L2. L2 was bringing back up to L1, and then you would access L1 always. Okay? What's going to happen if... Uh, there's another memory address uh, in the with 110, but it's different. So it's, it's still, still you're going to have a miss because you were hoping to get another one with a different tag, but, but you haven't. Yeah. And you write it back? Yeah, you write it on top of that. Yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah. Good question. Okay, so now the rest of those sevens are already uh, non initialized. So again, we're going to have another miss by this incoming address which is referring to 0 0.010 uh, which is this this index with this tag nothing was there so there's another cache miss you have to bring it back up from memory okay now um, at this point if I uh, if I want to have a one zero one one zero right which is twenty two 
Do I have a miss or hit? Why miss? Why hit? Is it a miss? Is it hit? Why? Yeah, so you check the 110, which was this, with the tag of 10. So that means that I had the same data that I was hoping to find, which was already brought up here. So that's why it's going to be a hit, right? That's why we have a hit here. Guys. All right? Just like that, for the other one, I'll have a hit again. Okay? So I'm just going to go fast on this. And as, you, as your colleague asked, if you have different tags and a data available as well, still you're going to have a miss again. Okay? So, uh, shh. In order to find a position of a memory uh, for three different caches, you're going to have a direct map. You just have to find the block number mod number of blocks. For set associative, you're going to have block number mod number of set, right? And inside the set, for each set, all tags can be searched, right? I'll give you an example. For fully associative, blocks can go anywhere. You don't have any set, okay? So in general, for all of th those three, you can define a memory address and uh, deconstruct it or so uh, in three segments: tag, index, and block offset. Okay. So uh, I wish we could find another. Let me just find another slide and add to this for today. Okay, so this is a comparison of all these three. So when you have a direct map, so assuming you have eight entries, right, eight blocks, in a direct map, you just have to distinguish them between tags and data because you have, for each of those tags, you have only one place to, to um, you know, to, to put your data. That's why it's called one-way set associative. It's, you know, if you think about the way we, call these names is each set has only one way to, to map, right? One way set associative. If you have n way set associative is telling you that for each of those sets you have how many ways, right? To the power of two uh, to map those entries. So when we have two way set associative is for each of those sets, which are four now, we have two way to place them. Okay, two way set, set associative. If you have four way set associative for each of those sets, we have four ways, right, to block the data. All of them are the same, uh, but the way we define it are different. For eight way set as associative, which is a fully associative, we don't have any blocks. I mean, we have block, it's only one, so we don't care about it. It's, it's not a parameter anymore. Um, so you have eight way sets, so any of those sets, right? Does that make sense? So, uh, the tag, in the, in the previous question, you meant the tag was two bits. That means for, the, for direct map, on that specific question. So, like, how many bits do we allocate to the tag? I'll have an, another example right away. Yeah. So,
So four cases is your last question, and then we all go home. Um, the question is, we have, uh, where was the question? Actually, let me just copy paste the question. Uh, let me read the question because I forgot what it was. So that was a question here. So, guys, ten more minutes. Focus. So the question is, um, we have a cache of four ninety six blocks, forty ninety six blocks, a four word block size. So each block size contains of four words and a sixty four bit address. Find a total number of sets and total number of tags. Okay, let me just copy this to have it here. Uh, I'm going to put it somewhere here. So I put it in the title, so at least you have it, okay? So, we have four, 4096 blocks, a four-word block size, and 64-bit address, okay? So since we have four-bit, uh, four-word size, first of all, each of those four word are eight, right? Each of those are um, and each of them I actually are <coughs> is sixty four bit. So each of them are actually four byte. Okay? So you have four, four word. So that's why you have two to the raise of four, which is 16 bytes per block. It's the size of the word you have. So out of this 64 bit addressing, which is the overall address for the memory, we need to allocate four bit in order to distinguish those 16 blocks per word. <clears throat> so that's why we need to deduct four from 64 right away and the rest what remains for the rest of the 60 bits are going to be used for index and tag so first of all we got rid of this allocation so this by block offset is, is done okay so it's four now this is including together is 60 now we have to distinguish it with direct map uh, and, and ways associative and fully associative so now the problem is 
how are we going <clears> to <throat> allocate these two, okay? For direct map, we have 4096 blocks, okay? How many bits do I need in order to distinguish those? Each bit is in a binary word, so 0 and 1. So if I make a log 2 out of that, it's going to make me 12. Because 2 to the raise of 12 is 496. Okay. Always remember that 2 to the raise of 10 is 1024 and start from there. Normally it's going to help you to go, to go up or down. Okay. <clears throat> 2 to the raise of 10 is 1024. 11 is uh, 2028. 20, and then 496. Okay. So I need to take 12 bits out of those 60. So if I deduct these two, it's going to be 60 minus 12, and then I have to multiply it to 4096 blocks. And this will give me the total size of the direct map cache 197k type bits. Okay? Does that make sense? So, uh, if you arrive to this point, Whatever you increase in your set from a direct map, which is a one-way set associative, to more n-ways set associative, it's as if you're reducing the number of blocks, right, by a factor of two when you go one up or four up, right? It's going to be, again, two, two. So by each factor of two, you're effectively uh, reducing the number of bits to allocate for that. Instead of 12... If you have a two-way set associative, it will reduce the block by a factor of two, right? Because two can be represented by one bit. So you're going to have 2,048 sets. Okay. Guys, if you don't want to stay here, you can leave. <clears throat> because the rest of the students are not here. Okay. So we are to the point that we are 2,048 sets. Okay. So 11 bit will represent my two-way set associative. So I have to deduct that 60 minus 12, the same of the 4096, is going to be 401 kilobit. Okay. So these are the total number of sets. If I increase it to four-way, that effectively reduces four a factor of four out of my direct map, which is two bits out of 12 which is 10, right? Now I have to deduct 60 minus 10 and the rest of the 4096. So this will effectively becomes 205k. And a fully set associative is completely random. You can just allocate it wherever you want. There, there's only one block. That's why we don't have any blocks. So all of those could be an entry and the total of tag remaining from 64 was 60, right? Because we allocate four of them because of the word size. And then it's going to be leading to 246k tag bits, okay? <clears throat> so that's one of the questions you're going to get asked. The other one, which is the final one, is when you have multi-level cache. You have L1 cache and you have an L2 cache or perhaps an L3, then your memory. Okay, how are you going to compute the uh, penalty and misses? Okay, for instance, <clears throat> I've already covered this in the course, so I'm just going to go fast here. So you have you've given a CPI of one and a clock rate. The miss rate was two percent, and you only have L1. So ninety-eight percent you had hit, two percent you had miss. Okay, when you miss, you don't have any L2. You have to go to memory. So you have to, your increase time will be way, way higher. It's going to be 10 nanoseconds, 100 nanoseconds, okay? So by having your clock rate, you can compute the missed penalty of going to your CPU because your clock rate was this and your CPI was 1, so you were supposed to uh, compute it very faster. But since by this clock rate, you are arriving at 100, 100 nanoseconds, so each clock cycle would be way, way smaller, uh, way, way longer actually. 
So that means that you have to waste 400 cycles as a missed penalty to access your memory. Does that make sense? So for 2% of the instructions, you have to pay a big price whenever you miss. <clears throat> so adding that to your ideal CPI is going to be your base CPI for that 98%, plus the mem install per instructions for that 2%, which is 8. So overall, having one level of cash and 2% cash miss, um, cash miss rate your CPI will uh, expand from 1 to 9, okay? So now, let's see if we add uh, another level to, to the cache as L2 with its own set of miss rate, what's going to happen to the equation, okay? Now, we add L2, the access time of L2 is worse than L1, but much better than MEM, right? So it's somewhere in the middle. So L1 was way faster, L2 is sort of in the middle, and then MEM. So it's 5 nanoseconds. You see, previously it was 100 nanoseconds, so 20 times faster. And the global miss rate to main memory of L2 is <clears throat> half a percent. So what does this tell you? The cases that L1 misses and L2 misses and you go to MEM is overall half a percent. So that's a global miss. Okay. Still, we don't know the, the, the local miss. We can compute it. Uh, I'll, I'll let you know uh, in the next slide. But with that, for each of the global misses, you have to pay a penalty for L2, right? <clears throat> so now we have to consider two cases, L2 hit or L2 miss. L2 hit is L1 miss and L2 hit. And L2 miss is both of them are missing, right? So for the case of heat, you have to only have to miss penalty of um, 5 nanosecond by that CPU frequency you had, which is going to be 20 cycle. Now you see that previously it was 400 cycle. Now L2 has 20 cycles. So the penalty you have to pay is this amount of cycles in general. So the new CPI, which was previously, this one was 400, now is 1 plus 2% of this value plus the cases that L2 also misses, right? So you're going to have 3.4, okay? There is another alternative method to compute that. I, I place it here. You can have a look at it at home. And finally, <clears throat> the global miss rate for the last level cache is the miss rate of L1 multiply miss rate of L2, right? You had the global miss rate already. You divide it by miss rate of L1, so L2 was locally 25% having had the miss rate, okay? So don't get confused with this global and local. All right, guys. Um, so see you in the final, okay? Um, do you have the final sample? What is it? Yeah, final sample. Final sample? Yeah, final sample.